Three years ago, I said several times that the nations that began this war thought it would be over by Christmas. That was Christmas 1914. They were wrong. For this week comes the fourth Christmas of the war, and it's still far from over. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, Russia signed an armistice with the Central Powers. The next thing is to hammer out an actual peace treaty. The German High Command was planning on taking huge chunks of Russian territory. And though Lenin was basically okay with this, Austria-Hungary wasn't. The British, worried by Russia leaving the war, were considering separate pieces with other Central Powers. Enver Pasha was dreaming of conquest in Central Asia, and the Bolsheviks were fighting the Cossacks on the Black Sea. Here's what followed. Well, those peace negotiations did, for one thing. They began the 22nd at Brest-Litovsk. The Russian delegates immediately had some suggestions, which included 1. No forcible annexation of territory taken during the war. 2. Complete restoration of independence to nationalities who had lost it during the war. 3. Nationalities hitherto not enjoying independence could decide by plebiscite if they want to be part of other states or independent. Four safeguarding of the rights of minorities, and five, no war indemnities. Austro-Hungarian negotiator and Austrian foreign minister Count Chernin said he accepted one, two, and four, and refused number three. Five needed more discussion. He also wanted for Germany to be returned her overseas colonies. But as we saw last week, Germany considered itself in a position to make all sorts of demands, which we'll see in the new year. But what about now? Last winter, was the turnip winter in Germany, and a good portion of the population was starving or near to starvation. So how did the situation there look one year later? Well, Russia leaving the war was certainly a great bonus, but the British naval blockade was still slowly starving the civilian population. But, and an important but, big land gains with huge stores of grain from a settlement with Russia could alleviate that. Austria-Hungary, as we've seen, was little more than a shell of its former self, trying just to hang on. Bulgaria was isolated, and the Ottomans had troubles of their own. So Germany was pretty much on its own. But the situation there was not by any means hopeless. After another year of heavy casualties and the chronic lack of supplies, the German armies were certainly not what they'd been a year or two ago, but they weren't any more beaten up than the French or the British. Sure. They were way, way underquipped with things like rubber for tires or regular supplies of meat for the men. But they had advantages of their own. Right up at the top of that list was their defenses in France and Belgium. They were massive, sophisticated, 10-mile deep systems of interconnected and mutually supportive machine gun pillboxes, moat-like traps for infantry and tanks, and artillery-proof bunkers, all of it guarded by shoals of barbed and razor wire. Hundreds of thousands of laborers, many of them prisoners of war and civilians from captured territory, had been engaged in building this system since the start of the stalemate. The result was a barricade that, once reinforced with troops from the east, promised to be all but impregnable. Thing is, the Germans also had new offensive doctrines, as we saw in the Baltic and at Caporetto. The Houthier stormtroop assault tactics might be a way to break the deadlock in the west. They'd never been used on such a huge scale before. But there didn't seem to be any reason why they wouldn't work like that if Germany launched an offensive. That's what the High Command had to consider after playing defense in the West all of 1917. And it was really Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff's decision. He was certainly influenced by the success General Herbert Plumer had with the British at Passchendaele, and the French also had at Verdun and La Malmaison with limited scope attacks. But a huge deciding factor was, as you may guess, the U.S. Army and its impending arrival in Europe. There were already tens of thousands of men coming per month, and that number was growing and growing. Ludendorff figured that they wouldn't be a big problem until mid-1918. But after that, they could tip the scales of the war the wrong way. So if Germany was going to win in the West, they had the first half of the year in which to do it. Now, I mentioned last month that German Army Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg had decided he wanted a game-winning offensive for the spring. Ludendorff now had a plan to create 42 elite mobile divisions from the best of the best soldiers Germany had. 
The booklet, The Attack and Trench Warfare, about Houthi air tactics, was given out among the armies. Officers were taken out of the line for four weeks of retraining, and the cream of the soldiers became experts in light machine guns, trench mortars, flamethrowers, and grenades, the hallmarks of the new system. But where to attack? And equally, whom to attack? The British or the French? Well, last month Ludendorff had met with some generals who had ideas on those points. One, Friedrich von der Schulenburg, proposed an attack on both sides of the Verdun salient, since the French had dramatically weakened their defenses there. This would shorten the German line and drive the French back towards Paris. One, Hermann von Kuhl, proposed Flanders, where the British would have their backs to the sea and might be forced off the continent, if not destroyed. Ludendorff said that wherever it was, he had three conditions before there would be any offensive at all. Neither Russia nor Italy could pose any active threat. The attack had to come as early as possible, like February or March, and whoever was attacked, the ultimate end objective was to defeat the British. If that could happen by mid-1918, the French couldn't continue alone, and the Americans wouldn't matter. Well, that was his thinking, anyhow. So now, on December 27th, Ludendorff met with Schulenburg and Kuhl again. They still pushed for their ideas, so Ludendorff had his army groups all along the front make plans for possible offensives at Verdun, Flanders, Arras, Champagne, Saint-Quentin, and the Vosque. And that is what the German command structure on the Western Front found itself doing over Christmas and the New Year. They were all making competing plans for the mother of all offensives that would end the war within the next six months. But their allies were trying to win the war in the field right now. The Austrians were determined to defeat the Italians before the heavy snows came, which were over a month late this year. General and former Austrian Chief of Staff Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf told his men they'd celebrate Christmas Mass in Venice. They attacked the 23rd and advanced about three kilometers, taking the Col di Rosso and 9,000 prisoners. But an Italian counterattack the 24th took it back, and the first heavy snow fell that night, stopping the Austrians and allowing the Italians to celebrate Christmas Mass in Venice as usual as the Monte Grappa Piave River front grows quiet. And in the Middle East, the British held Christmas Mass in newly taken Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which was a total PR coup for them. But at the end of the week, the Ottomans, with German assistance, made a big try to retake Jerusalem. Their attacks lasted for 26 hours, but British commander Edmund Allenby counterattacked the Turkish right flank, and by the 29th, the British had carried the day and inflicted heavy losses. Armored cars and aircraft were used to secure the holy city to a distance of 16 kilometers. And the brand new secular Soviet state saw some events of its own. Russian women win the right to divorce. Three years in the future, they'll also gain the right to four months of maternity leave and other rights to try and establish true gender equality. As far as I'm aware, that was the first divorce law that actually put men and women on equal footing. Also, the Bolsheviks created the Cheka to fight counter-revolutionary activity and sabotage. Felix Dzerzhinsky is the first chairman, and its first charter is to track the economic activity of wealthy people. And we come to the end of the week with fighting in Italy and the Middle East, and peace negotiations between Russia and the Central Powers. Oh, and Admiral Sir Rosalind Weems became Britain's first sea lord. And Christmas came, and Christmas went. Goodwill on earth, and peace to all men. Well, peace talks were finally underway for at least some of those men fighting this endless war. But even as they proceed, those same men begin fighting among their own former compatriots. I suppose, in these conclusions, I talk about bloodshed and modern war and no end in sight to the point where it might become almost monotonous. So I won't do that today. Today, I'll just say that whatever was going on a hundred years ago, we wish peace on earth and goodwill to all mankind now. Happy holidays from all of us to all of you. See you in 1918. If you'd like to see our episode about the Battle of Lake Tanganyika, it was really good. I love that one. You can click right here for that one. Our Patreon supporter of the week is everyone. Yep, everyone who supported us this year and before on Patreon. We could not, seriously, could not do this show without your support. So thank you for that support. See you next year.